All right, welcome in, folks. Thank you for taking time to watch this. Andrew Sluter, pastor of the Bible Baptist Church here in Asheville, North Carolina. And I've got a special guest with me here that we are doing a discussion tonight on Calvinism. We've got Will Kinney. And uh, Brother Kinney, thank you so much for coming on and being a guest uh, for this discussion tonight. You bet. Glad to. All right. Well, um, we have got, I know a lot of people have been anxious about this, wanting to see it. And uh, I'll be honest, I don't have a whole lot of Calvinists that have come on. Uh, so kind of some of the ones that have said they would come on are guys that, you know, uh, you just don't take anybody's offer. And then some of the ones that I've wanted to come on, they haven't come on. But I've heard a lot about you in the past. Um, one good thing that we'll, we'll start out with an agreement here. Um, one good thing about you, Brother Kenny, that is going to be make this e an easier discussion is that you're a King James Bible man. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally. yeah. And I, I've heard good things about your stance on the King James Bible, that you've got great material on it. And so I, am, of course, am a King James Bible man as well. And so great. it's easier to discuss, debate or whatever you want to call it when you uh, when you can at least agree on the final authorities. <laughs> That's right. Amen. I agree with that. So anyway, uh, well, really quick, why don't you just tell us who you are? What you do a little bit and just you know, take two or three minutes here and just tell you tell us a little bit about your background and all that. Well, I'm uh, gloriously retired. Uh, I've been retired now about seven years. I used to be a, uh, a charter school, high school Spanish teacher. And um, I'm married, happily married, and I've got uh, two grown sons and I've got three grandkids. And um, uh, I became a Christian, well, when I'm in my early 20s. But before that, I wasn't brought up in a Christian home. And they went to church maybe once a year or something like that. And um, so I basically was an atheist, and then I became kind of an agnostic. I just didn't know if there was a God. And then uh, in my early early 20s, I was at uh, Colorado University, and the whole hippie movement broke out. And um, I dived in with both, you know, head over heels. And so I was uh, into the the LSD and the, all the drugs and all that stuff. And I, that got me into Eastern religions. And I was into yoga and Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and Transcendental Meditation. And I read books on Buddhism and all this stuff. So I was really into it. I got into the tarot cards and just about anything out there. And I was into that for probably about three, three or four years. And um, then I, one day, I, you know, I was reading all my religious books and everything, but one day, you know, I started reading the Bible as well. And one day I was walking around and I sat down and I was reading and it, I read a verse that said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And that just kind of got my attention. And then later on, I was hitchhiking around the country and I went to this Jesus house. There used to be a lot of them back then, ex-hippies that got converted. Um, and I was... Spent the night, and the next morning I'm in the in the room when I've got my pendulum swinging over my food to see if the vibes are good. And I mean, I was really into all this weird stuff. <laughs> and one of the elders called me aside, and uh, he wanted to talk to me a little bit. And I don't remember much about what he said. They did throw me out of the house. But one of the verses he read, he said, uh, he was reading it in Second Timothy, I think it is, about the signs of the last days and perilous times will come. And he said, uh, ever learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. And that hit me like a brick right in the forehead. That, that verse just smacked me. And uh, <clears throat> so I left there, and I still wasn't a Christian. And then one day I uh, was walk I was hitchhiking around and walking around Greeley, Colorado. I used to go to school there but one time. And I found this Bible track on the ground, and I picked it up and looked at it. And it was a young guy and his wife had just started a ministry with uh, college students. And uh, I went over to see, I had an address, and I went over to see him. And he invited me to stay for dinner, and they were having a study on the Book of Romans that night, and asked if I'd like to stay, and I said, sure. And as we're going through the Book of Romans and everything, and then he asked me if I'd like to, you know, receive the Lord, did I believe? And I, you know, I knew I had to either reject everything except Jesus Christ, or somehow I had to explain him away because, you know, he didn't fit anything else. I mean, he was the only way, you know, I'm not. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And uh, so I, you know, prayed and I said, yeah, you know, I believe it. 
yeah, I believe he's the only Savior, and so I received Christ as my Lord and Savior. And, uh, went on pretty well for several years, and then I had a serious backsliding time. And then the Lord brought me back, and I've been back, walking with him pretty well for about about 35 years now. So Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, let's get into what everybody has tuned <coughs> in to to, to watch <laughs> okay. Alrighty. Uh, our discussion tonight and and we're talking about calvinism of course there's there's five basic points to calvinism and right. so we're not going to pretend to be able to discuss all five points tonight we could no way in the world do it justice but specifically the two points we want to discuss are calvin or excuse me calvinism our unconditional election and limited atonement, because limited I think I, I think we could agree that there are several people out there that are not Calvinists who would look at total depravity and say, OK, I agree with some parts of that. And then irresistible grace. OK, maybe I agree with some parts of that or perseverance of the saints, you know, maybe some parts of that. But the two points that a lot of people really seem to um, if they if they disagree with Calvinism, the two points they really, you know, kind of nose up at are unconditional election and limited atonement. Although that there are several who wouldn't agree with any point, like me, I, I don't agree sure. with any point of Calvinism. Um, okay. You know, I'm, there are some guys who say I'm a three pointer or, four, or a four pointer, and I've never understood that. Um, I, I'm pretty sure you're of the persuasion that you can't just be a, a three pointer or a four pointer. It's to be consistent, you have to be a five pointer, right? Well, that's my my view. I, I believe that. I'm, I'm I wasn't always believed this way. I mean, for a long right. time, I was I was taught free will theology, and I believed that, and taught it, and preached it, and did all that stuff. I mean, I, I cause, so I know where you're coming from. And uh, but no, at this point, you know, several years ago, ooh, it's been almost thirty years now that God, I believe, began to open up my eyes uh, to the truth of election, and. Mm -hmm. Of all things, he started using the Old Testament with me. You know, it was where God chose the children of Israel above all the nations on the face of the earth to be his people. And verses like that started getting me thinking, well, wait a minute, you know, God just chose them. And uh, they didn't have any, anything to do with it. I mean, he chose them. And so that started getting me interested in this, and I began studying it more and thinking about it. And so, yeah, at this point, I think the last one to fall for me probably was limited atonement. Mm. And so I understand the difficulty that people have with that. And uh, But no, I'm, I'm a solid five-point Calvinist. Yeah. I don't agree with John Calvin on a lot of things he said or did. But as far as the five points go, I'm I'm there. You know, that's what I believe. Sure, sure. So let, let's get into it, unconditional election. Now, I have here um, the Canons of Dort. Um, okay. I, I've read through them. Of course, you know, well, like with anything you ask <laughs> You ask a dispensationalist, you know, are you dispensationalist? And, you know, a, a hyper dispensationalist, a moderate dispensationalist, a classic dispensationalist would all say yes. <laughs> and so okay. I, know, I know that it can be similar with, for example, a Calvinist. You ask a, sure. are you a Calvinist and you can get three different people say yes, but they have three different lines of thought or thinking, whatever. Um, exactly. But, but with unconditional election, there are two different facets two different schools of thought, and these are some egghead terms. I know you'll know what they mean, and I know what they mean, but for the listeners, maybe we, we want to define them. There's two views of election. There's infralapsarianism, and there's superlapsarianism. And so the basically that God, infralapsarianism is the view that God chose to make mankind. He chose to allow them to fall. And then out of that fallen mankind, he chose some to save. Okay. And then the superlapsarian position is that God, before he made anything, already chose who he was going to save and already chose who he was going to damn. Which view would you kind of, what? where would you fall between those two positions? Yeah, I've, I've heard of both of them. I haven't gotten into it that deeply because to me I, I don't i just see that it, it says that he chose us in christ before the foundation of the world so i would have to say well that was before the fall mm -hmm. and it just seems like before the fall i mean he knew what was going to happen uh, i don't believe god is the author of sin 
what I believe actually is is the cause of sin is free will. It's that one which man most boasts that is actually the cause of his fall. Because anytime there are two independent free wills, they're eventually going to come into conflict. And when the Lord was here, this, the second Adam, that he said, that, or the last Adam, excuse me, that he said, not my will, but thine be done. <clears throat> and he came to do the will of the Father. And so uh, he, when you yield to the will of God, that's when everything goes out fine. But the actual cause of sin is free will. He gave Satan free will. You have the five, I will ascend and I will be like the most high. And you have Adam. And Adam had a free will. I believe that. But he chose uh, to disobey God and he chose the woman over, the, over God. If you and I had been there, we would have done the same thing. And we still have a will. We have a will even in our fallen state. But it can only follow our nature. And our nature is that we enjoy sin, we like sin, we choose sin. And that's our disposition, our nature. God doesn't force us to sin. Um, I don't believe God is the author of sin at all. I think God set it up in such a way that it's free will. That in which man most boasts is actually the cause of his fall. So let me ask you this. Do you believe that God chose certain men to be saved and chose certain men to go to hell? Well, I believe that if he it says that he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, he predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will. So if he chose some, and it says in 2 Thessalonians 2.13 that, he, that he, he, he thanks God that he has chosen us to salvation from the beginning. And so if he chose some, well, then he necessarily did not choose the others. Mm -hmm. So do you? I don't see any way around that. Okay, so you would you would ascribe to the fact that God did create certain men and and before the foundation of the world decreed that certain men would go to hell. Yeah, I would have to say that because he if he chose some, then he necessarily did not choose the others. Right. Well, and right. And, and, and and yeah, and and I'm I'm glad that you would say that because there are some uh, uh, of. There are some Calvinists that wouldn't say that. They'd say, well, no, God didn't choose anybody to go to hell. He absolutely never chose anybody to go to hell. He just simply chose who was going to heaven. Everybody else was already going to hell, and he just chose who was going to heaven, but he didn't choose anybody to go to hell. Well, that's that's kind of like double speak. It's it, it doesn't make, when you carry that out to its logical conclusion, if he mm -hmm. has the ability to choose everybody, but he doesn't, inadvertently he is choosing However you want, however you want to soften the blow, <laughs> sure, he is he is he is choosing them to go to hell because he right. is, he is he is non electing them. Um, right. Let me, let me step in a minute. Though. The, the yeah, balance yeah. of that is 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 a lot of people have the wrong concept. I think of who man is. <clears throat> you know, man is not some innocent babe in the woods. I mean, man by nature, what we are, <clears throat> it says that there is none that doeth good. There is none that seeketh God. Romans 3, and we're, we're his enemies. You know, we love darkness rather than light. We are God's enemies, and our whole nature is set against him. And so, you know, if we got what we deserve, every single one of us would end up in hell. But God has mercy on whom he will have mercy. And, you know, the vessels of mercy which he have foreprepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called. So, you know, if you're if that's total grace, because we sure don't deserve it. So let me ask you this. When we talk about unconditional election, okay. what that means is, is according to the Calvinistic view that before the foundational world, God chose who is going to be saved. So let me ask you this. When do you think exactly a man becomes elect? Well, it says he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. I think we're we're born either we're, we're elect or we're not elect. When we're born, yeah. Well, we we were elect before we were born. Okay, so you, we were part of the elect before before we were even born. Yeah. Okay, so you believe you believe that that a man is part of the elect, but before he gets saved. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So when when do you believe a man gets in Christ? Well, we're, I, okay, that's a, that's a good question. I think we're chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. 
what there is in, in, in the Bible we call positional truth and practical truth. Positional truth, like the, it says in uh, Romans 8, it says that those that he predestinated, he called, those he called, he justified, he justified, he glorified. Are you glorified at this moment? It says that we're seated together with Christ in heavenly places. Is that true of you? Mm -hmm. Are you seated with Christ in heavenly places? Mm -hmm. I mean, right now, is that true of you? Uh, well, yes and no. Okay, there's the uh, yes yeah. and no. Because you have what you call your position. That's who we are in Christ. And our practice, we're down here on this earth in these bodies that are going to die. And, you know, it doesn't sure doesn't look like I'm glorified or you are. And uh, I'm not seated in glory at, least at this moment. I'm right here in front of this computer. But according to God's plan, you and I are seated together with Christ in the heavenly places. And um, our life is hid with Christ in God. Right. So when do you believe a man gets in Christ, though? Well, again, that's position and practice. Positionally, we were God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. I believe that we were in him when he died. And I've got verses to support that, and we're going to get into that when we get into limited atonement. But we were in Christ when he died, and we were in Christ when he was raised from the dead. And yet I wasn't even born, nor, nor were you. Mm -hmm. And so in this lifetime, then in our practice, we come into this world. We don't know God. We don't care about God. I sure didn't. And he draws us, if we're one of his sheep, he draws us to himself, the sanctification of the Spirit. He sets us apart, and he starts working on us. And through life's experiences, he eventually brings us to the point of where I believe in Christ. I hear the gospel, and, and I believe. God gives me that faith to believe. And so there's a sense in which I'm converted. I'm converted at that time. I'm born again. And then the Holy Spirit comes to live within us once you're converted. But when do you get in Christ? Well, like I said, you're in Christ before the foundation of the world. He's our federal head. So you, okay. you, don't, you, believe, you, you believe you were in Christ before the foundation of the world. But it says, I don't, I, that's, I don't, that, to me, that's what it means. It also says that we were raised together with Christ. Well, it, and we'll get to that because okay. I, I, I would disagree with the interpretation of, of how you're looking at it. Hang on, let me. Okay, that'd be fun to look at then. Let, let, me, get, let me get my Bible. I'm sitting like bringing a gun, not bringing the gun to a gunfight. Hang on. <laughs> I set it off here for a second. Um, well, if, if you were in Christ before the foundation of the world, and a man has been in Christ since the foundation of the world, um, and I've heard that a lot of Calvinists won't admit that they, they, they will try to fudge away from the fact that they believe they were in Christ from the foundation of the world. But really, in essence, that's what Calvinism has to teach. But how would you how would you respond to Romans chapter 16 and verse seven, where Paul says, salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me right that's their experience that's the practicality um that's when they came by experience that they were in christ there's a difference between position and practice um could you give me another place where the where the so would this be the only case where there's a practical or uh, where the practical comes into play because if we're being consistent with the scriptures okay and, and it doesn't say we were in him from the foundation of the world. We were chosen in him from the foundation of the world. And verse 5, having predestinated us to the adoption of children. And we'll get into the adoption of children <clears throat> here in just a second with the conversation. And I'm sure we'll disagree on that. But um, when, when Paul got in Christ, that's when he got saved. A man is put, we're, we're baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. Right. Do you would you agree that the moment of salvation, a man is baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ? Um. Well, okay, we're mixing up. I think practice and and position again. You asked for a case of position, right? Are you in Ephesians right now? 
I'm in First Corinthians, but I can be in Ephesians. Okay, please, Ephesians, yeah. Okay. I want to ask you about these verses, because these are some of the verses that, to me, clearly teach uh, limited atonement. And it has to do with directly, with, I think, your question. Okay. If you look at, um, <clears throat> excuse me, if you look at chapter 2, verse 4, starting there. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love with he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So here it says that we were dead in sins, quickened together with Christ, raised up together, and made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So who is the us here? It's the believers. Is it before they were believers? Or after I, they were believers? I think that it happens at the moment of salvation. It doesn't say that. Well, well here's look when it happened. No, no, look at the verse and see what it happened. I understand even when we were dead in sins, when we were dead in sins, so you're saying we were dead in sins before we were even born, before like we were even created. When, according to this, it said, when were we raised, when were we quickened? It doesn't say when we were quickened. It says we were quickened together with Christ. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we were raised up together in Christ. Okay. And we're seated in Christ now in the heavenly places. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that's referring to that we were there at the crucifixion and we were there at the resurrection. Because, no, because when it says we were together, I am, I am, qui- I am raised up now. When I got resurrected, I am now raised with Christ. When did that happen? I wasn't raised with the moment I got saved. Doesn't say that. I wasn't There's no verse that says that. Well, well, hang on. So would you say, would you say then that a man is not, de- would you say then that believers are born alive? No, you're mixing up again position, who we are in Christ. He's our federal head. Like you and I, we were in Adam. Do you believe we were in Adam when he fell? Yeah, like because of Adam's sin, I I am a sinner. We all sinned in Adam. We were like looked at as in Adam when he fell. Yeah, as in Adam, all die. Right. And so in Christ shall all be made alive. In Christ, right. But we were in Adam at one time, even though Mm -hmm. I wasn't born. I wasn't here physically. He was our federal head, our representative. When he fell, the whole human race fell. So, but I wasn't even born. But this doesn't answer the question of like 1 Corinthians 12, where it says in verse 13, for by one spear are we all baptized into one body. Okay, I don't have a problem with that. And when does that happen? Um, I'm not sure. So we're sealed with the Holy Ghost once we believed. So if right. you think that that's the same thing, which it may be, then it happens when you're converted. Exactly. So that is when we are put into the body of Christ. Colossians, That's our practice. Colossians chapter 2, I, I, the problem I'm having is, is I don't see the difference between the practice and the positional here because you're not in Christ until, I mean, positionally, I'm not a son of God until I receive Jesus That's Christ as my Savior. That's not true. Well, he said that he would it, gather he came together. Into, the, the he came into his of, own. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Become the sons of God. Uh Uh-huh. Even to them which believe on his name. But we were children of God. We've always been children. When he planted the the seeds, we've always been children. A son is somebody who enters into maturity. When he planted the the, the, the seeds. Oh, I know you don't. But... We were sons. We become sons of God. Look, well, that just leads us into Galatians. But look, I want to stick here look, with, with the. Okay, let's go into Galatians a minute. Well, let's look at. I, I want to look at Colossians back to the baptism thing really quick. Okay. All right, because Colossians chapter two, verse number eleven, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. 
buried with him in baptism. Right. What kind of buried, baptism is it that's talking spiritual, about? Here? Spiritual baptism. It happened at the, what baptism did, was that? That was the baptism when you got put into the body of Christ. No. Well, in a sense, but the baptism is actually the baptism into death. It happened at the cross. No. We, Look at the verse. Look at the bury, verse. Bury with him in baptism, wherein also bury we are with risen him. with him through the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. And that does not happen until the moment of salvation. No, back up and look at the verses again. Let's back up. Look, let's look at the verses again. Buried with him in baptism. That baptism isn't water baptism. I, I fully agree with that. Okay. It's his baptism into death. He said, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straight until it be accomplished? Mm -hmm. And he told Peter and John, he said, you shall be baptized with the same baptism that I'm baptized with. He's not talking about water baptism. He's talking right. about his baptism into death, right? When he died on the cross. And so buried with him, buried with him, not like him, with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him. We're risen with Christ through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him. We were quickened together with Christ. That's what it teaches in Ephesians, that when he died, we died. When he rose, we rose. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, not that like Christ. That doesn't happen when he died and when he rose again. It we does. are partakers of that the moment we get saved. Because you're, you're adding that to the scriptures, brother. I'm not, though, because verse 13, having forgiven you all trespasses, when, uh -huh. when did you get your trespasses forgiven? My trespasses uh, were forgiven at the cross. I was redeemed at the cross. I, re I, yeah. But you can receive the forgiveness of sins. But our, our sins, were, that's what it, the verse says. It says, you, being dead in your sins and, and uncircumcision, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Jesus Christ is our federal head. We are in him. We were in him when he died. We were in him when he rose again. And so that's our, that's, that's our position in Christ. I'm seated right now in the heavenly places in Christ. But in my experience here on this earth, I hear the gospel, and then I, 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 the gospel isn't about something God wants to do or hopes to do. It's about something he did. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And so when I believe that, I believe what he already did for me, not what he's going to do or he's in the process of doing. It's something he actually did at the cross. If you're redeemed, and I believe you are, you were redeemed at the cross before you were even born. No, I don't believe that at all. You have any verses that teach us otherwise? If, if, well, of course. The moment a man yeah. gets... Let's see the verse. Okay, Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1. Okay. All right, look at Ephesians 1 and verse number 13. In whom, also, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. When did you get sealed with the Holy Ghost? That's different from being redeemed. Being redeemed is not the same as being sealed. I was sealed with the Holy Ghost when I believed. That's what it says. But when was I redeemed? We were redeemed at the cross. So when you so you you believe that you were redeemed, I'm trying to wrap my mind around it here because I'm sure you probably are. <laughs> I've never heard, I've never heard a Calvinist say any of this stuff. Okay, um, well, you know what? Actually, let me just interject one thing and then you can go on with your thought on redemption. But 
an Armenian like yourself actually doesn't believe that anybody was redeemed at the cross. Mm -hmm. You don't believe anybody was redeemed mm -hmm. at the cross. So that's just a potential redemption. Right. Yeah, but that's nowhere taught in the Bible. The Bible teaches that we were actually redeemed at the cross. Okay. Here, here's, here's the problem. If, okay. you, if, if you say that, then you have people being born again and regenerated and all that stuff before they ever have faith in Christ. Yeah, that's true. And that is nowhere taught in the Bible. You have Romans when, chapter, you have, you have Rom, Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, Lord okay. Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So when did you get <laughs> saved? You're confusing terms, brother. You're confusing the term saved and the term redeemed, or even the term born again. Okay? Mm -hmm. It says in Ephesians 2, where we read, and in Colossians, that we were quickened together with him. We were raised up together with him. And I'm seated now in the heavenly places in Christ. Um, look at First Peter. It says that he begot us again. Let's take a look at that. Interesting verse. Great verse. First Peter. Ah, uh, one, I think it is. Yeah, okay, great. Here it is. Verse 3, 1, 3. Okay, so blessed be God and the Father and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He begat us again by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's what's being taught in Ephesians 2 and in Colossians 2, that we were quickened together with him and raised up together with him and we're now seated in the heavenly places in Christ. So do you That's believe, our position in Christ. So do you believe you were born dead, or do you believe you were born alive? Uh, well, that's that's kind of tricky, um, because, it's, again, you get into practice and position. It's, in my experience, you know, like I was born and I wasn't, you know, I didn't believe in Christ. That comes later on. But it goes back to what did Christ do for me at the cross? Everything goes back to the cross. Well, my question well, yes. is, were you born dead or were you born alive? Well, it says you being dead in your trespasses and sins. And that was true of the Ephesians here. But were you uh, dead at the cross? Or, and, and see, this is where you're... Well, go ahead and answer. I mean, were you born dead or not? Practically, I was. But in position of who I was in Christ, no, I was alive. I was show quickened together. Where, show me one verse where it says you were born alive. Were you quickened together with Christ at the cross? I believe that I was quickened. I was spiritually resurrected the moment I got saved. Okay. What happened at the cross? Were you quickened together with him at the cross and raised up together with him? I disagree, with, I, I disagree with how you're interpreting right quick. What else does it mean? What else does it when, mean? When Okay. When I got saved, Christ is already mm -hmm. resurrected. When I got saved, according to Romans chapter 6... And verse number four, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. That mm -hmm. happens at the moment of salvation. What is the baptism there again? Spiritual baptism, when we're put into the body of Christ. Baptism, we were buried with him, with him, not like him, with him. In baptism, right. it's the baptism into death. But it clearly says, therefore we are buried with him by baptism, and if that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory uh -huh. of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we right. shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Right. So that the baptism, me and you, when we got saved, that's when we got baptized and put no, in the body we were, of Christ. 
the That's baptism what wrote first corinthians 12 13 says no you're confusing uh, you're confusing the baptism brother okay so the so we get so so the baptism of first corinthians 12 13 that puts us into the body how could you be how could you be in the body before being in the body because you before you you before you had mentioned that you believe that at the moment of salvation we got baptized into the body of Christ you admitted that that was salvation in 1 Corinthians 12 13 but then how do we get how do we get in the body how are we in the body at the crucifixion before we get into the body in 1 Corinthians 12 13 no I'm not sure about 1 Corinthians 12 13 what it's talking about there's a there's a whole body presented. It's not a body. When did, when did you get baptized with the Holy Ghost? Well, it might have been actually at the cross. I'm not sure. It never says that I'm baptized with the Holy Ghost when I believe. It, it it, that. It, the, the disciples and all those who believed at Pentecost were baptized with the Holy Ghost. Oh, true. Okay, that's when the Holy Ghost descended and formed yeah, that did the body not, of Christ. That did not happen at, so, and that did not happen on the cross. That happened at Pentecost, according to Acts eleven. The baptism of the Holy Ghost took place at Pentecost, and that's when they were put into the body. Therefore, you think that body was formed all at one time? Yes. In, okay. I think it was a mystery. I think it was a mystery not revealed until the Apostle Paul. But just because it's a mystery, doesn't mean it can't be in existence. First Corinthians, or excuse me, Ephesians three talks about the mystery. So, if the body, if those people are baptized and put into the body in Acts two, that's not the cross. The moment of salvation is when a man gets put into the body. No, it doesn't say that. It, okay, well then, when did you get baptized with the Holy Ghost? Well, if we're looking at this as First Corinthians uh, twelve thirteen. By one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Gentile, okay? You've got an entire body, correct? You got all the fingers, yeah. all the toes, uh, all the eyes. That's the entire body. So the whole body of Christ, which is all of the believers throughout time, if there's a sense in which we're all baptized into that body, even though I'm not, not alive, just like I was crucified with Christ before I was alive. I was raised together with him before I was even born. That's my position in Christ. And so there's a difference between baptized into the body, the whole body, and my being sealed with the Holy Ghost. Well, uh, I don't agree with that at all. The, okay. The, 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 the problem is, is, when did you personally get baptized by the Holy Ghost? I'm not sure. I would say if, if I'm going by this, I would have to say it probably took place at Pentecost when the body of Christ was formed. So you think you were put in at Pentecost? Well, it says, by one spirit are we all baptized. It doesn't say we are all being baptized. It's like you, we are baptized. It's like you say, I am married. It's talking about something that happened in the past, but it's true now. Well, if I say we're all, if I say me and you are married, that doesn't mean we got married at the same time. No, but if I say I am married or we are married, well, but we are all baptized. We're not all being baptized. Oh, I agree with that. I'm not being baptized now. I was baptized right. when I got saved. Well, maybe you got baptized with water, but I don't know about the spirit. I, I just, <laughs> not when I got no, I just don't see it that clearly. Well, I know you're forcing something. If you go back to Ephesians two, which you keep running away from, it's not forcing it. The, the, that's what I'm saying. This is why I disagree with how you're interpreting. Okay. When we got when we got put into the body, I don't think we were in Christ at, at, at his crucifixion. I don't think we were in Christ. It is. Well, then how do you deal with Ephesians two? Let's look at the scripture. Be, be, because the act when Jesus Christ did that, the moment I got saved. That's when it got applied to me. And so that act that he did on the cross, that act of resurrection, I now get put into that body that was crucified and that was raised from the dead. I think we're in agreement on the doctrine I, there. I think that what the, the big disagreement and the big issue is the fact that I wasn't in Christ when he did that because I got put into the body at the moment of salvation, according to Acts 2, 1 Corinthians 2.13. 
Oh, that's how you're reading 1 Corinthians 2, 13. But you're, if you go back to Ephesians 2, it says, all right, we were quickened together with Christ. Not like Christ, but with Christ. Who is the us there? Again, at the very least, it's got to be Paul and the people to whom he's writing, correct? The Ephesians, at the very least. And I think it would encompass the whole body of believers. Okay, I do too. All right. Again, the, the issue, like I said before, the issue is that according to 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and according to Acts 2, nobody was in the body. Nobody was in the body. Oh, that says we're baptized into the body of uh, the baptisms. By one spirit are we baptized into one body. Would you agree that baptism puts you into the body of Christ? Let, we'll not talk about what the baptism is right now. We'll get to that in just a second. But would you agree that baptism puts you into the body? Again, you, there are several kinds. There was the baptism into death. I was in Christ. He says, you said to Peter and John, right? He says, ye, ye shall be baptized with the same baptism that I am baptized with. And, and they were martyred, right? I mean, they were baptized. Is the baptism. That's not what he's talking about. I have a baptism to be baptized with. It's a real baptism. It's his baptism into death. Pardon me? Baptized into death. Okay. But what I'm saying is, is I agree that that, I don't think that's talking about spiritual baptism there. My question is, is in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, mm. is that baptism? Let's see. So such a divine so is a will by one spirit we are all baptized in one body. I don't know when that takes place. I don't know that you can say that that takes place when you're converted. Okay, well, Acts chapter number eleven and chapter eleven. Yeah. And then verse number fourteen. Uh I'm sorry, verse number fifteen. And as I begin to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. He is recounting the story of Cornelius in verse mm -hmm. 10, verses 45 through 48, where Cornelius receives the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. That happens at the moment they believe. Because look at what it says in verse 44, uh, Acts 10, 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And mm -hmm. the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came on them, uh, came, excuse me, came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. And okay. Telling the story in verse 16 of chapter 11, he recalls, hey, this is the baptism of the Holy Ghost that John promised. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I mean, it seems to be that's what it teaches. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Right, and that happens at the moment a person is saved. I can see that. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. Now, taking that another step now, uh -huh. that according to 1 Corinthians 12, 13, when we're baptized by the Spirit— that is what puts us into the body. Well, okay, again, I go back to the same thing of our experience, our practice. Did they experience that? But see, you're neglecting back there with Ephesians 2 and Colossians 2 that we were crucified with Christ. We were quickened together with him. We were raised up together with him. And I'm now seated I am crucified with Christ. Yeah. Currently, right now, I wasn't. But when did that happen? When I got saved. No. Well, it doesn't say that. Well, I, 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 like I said, and, and we'll move on here because I think we're at a little bit of a stalemate on the on the subject. Um, I, I would I would agree with you wholeheartedly that you know I am crucified with Christ. I am I am raised up together with Him, but. I don't get in on that until I get into his body. And, and, and well, then you're, you're, you're adding something to the scriptures there. Well, I don't think so. Okay. Because when you cross reference it with first, with first Corinthians 12, 13, but they can't contradict each other. I, if I, I was quickened together, together with Christ 
and then I was raised up together with him, and I'm seated in heavenly places in him. Mm-hmm. Then I can't to use 1 Corinthians 12, 13 to contradict that. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 has to be either speaking about my experience as a believer, but it doesn't nullify what took place at the cross. Well, I don't disagree with that. I just think that we get anyway. We're, I'm, I'm feeding myself here. I think okay. we're, we're at a repetitious point now. We've kind of all right. Okay. But, let, but let's let's stay in the vein of unconditional election. Okay. In Ephesians one. I know you wanted to go to Ephesians one, so I'll kind of let you take the reins here um, a little bit and just kind of go through what you believe about Ephesians one. I guess specifically verses uh, four and five. There, that's where everybody loves to go into Ephesians one. Okay. Well, I mean, I see it clearly. He chose us before the foundation of the world. He predestinated us under the adoption of children, and it's according to the good pleasure of his will. So what I often ask like uh, Arminians like yourself is that, uh, do you believe that you're one of the elect? Yes. Okay, just, good. Really quick, just a clarification. I'm kind. I'm almost okay with you calling me an Arminian. Um, I'm, I call okay. myself a four-point Arminian. Uh, All right. I don't believe, well, you believe in eternal security, right? I do. Be, I'm a staunch believer in eternal security. Okay. Well, thanks for clarifying because you're a four point. Yeah. Four yeah. point Arminian. I'm okay. Arminian until you get to the cross, and then after that, I'm a Calvinist. So. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but anyway, if you're one of the elect, okay. Yeah. Okay. Then how did that happen? Was there something that you did in order to become one of the elect, or was it solely the work of God? And you had nothing to do with it. Well, I believed on Christ. Okay, did that make you elect? Yes. Do you have any verse that supports that, teaches that? Well, I believe, well, we're going to go right back to it, unfortunately, here. Okay, well, I'd like to see the verse, because there's no verse that teaches that. Well, I believe that I, do you believe Christ is elect? Yes. Okay, so I believe that, according to Isaiah 42, 1, that Christ is the elect. That's also First Peter chapter 2. Sure. I believe that I became elect when I got in Christ. Well, you were, elect, you were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. That's how it happened. Well, and I believe the context of verses 4 and 5 here are not talking about the salvation of the soul, but especially verse 5, the predestination is talking about the adoption of children, not the salvation of the soul. Okay, can you be a child of God without having your soul saved? No. Okay, so what's the difference? Well, are you adopted? Well, yeah, it depends again on how you look, look at the, the word adoption and what it means. Because um, it means to place as a son. I think that it means to place as a mature son. Okay, so. But we were predestinated to that. We're predestinated. So when, when do you believe you became adopted? I was predestinated to that. Now, when it happened, I guess uh, you receive the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So that's when I was converted. So you believe you became adopted when you got converted? Yeah, but I was predestined to that. You were predestinated to be converted? Yeah. Which is the adoption Absolutely. of children? Right. Okay. And this is. But you didn't answer my question yet. When did you become elect, and how did it happen? I, well, I believe that I became elect when I got saved. You don't have a verse that supports that, though, brother. I, I, I do, because when I got in Christ is when I became elect. We are the elect. There is no verse that teaches that. Well, th- the problem is, is you can't find me a verse that says that you were predestinated to salvation. I got a verse that says I was chosen to salvation. Okay, but as we're going to look here, because this is where I want to go with it, Romans chapter 8, nobody... Every believer on planet Earth, none of us are adopted yet. Well, you're talking about the redemption. Oh, boy, you're talking about the redemption of the body, right? Well, that's the that's the thing. That's what adoption is. Is the redemption? No, there's also being adopted. Uh, Galatians says that we have received the spirit of adoption. It's we've not received, something we're waiting for. We've received the spirit of adoption, and that's exactly what. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father, that is, and 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 that is the down payment or the earnest of our inheritance. Romans chapter 8 clearly teaches in verse redemption of the body. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, 
even we ourselves groan within ourselves waiting for the adoption to it the, in the, our body. Yeah. Okay. And the adoption is the redemption of our body. That's when the final purchase of the possession is made. And that's exactly what Ephesians chapter one deals with because it says in Ephesians one verse 14, talking about the seal of the Holy ghost or the seal of the Holy spirit of promise, I should say in verse 13, uh -huh. which is the earnest earnest is a down payment sure. earnest is you pay $500 down to ensure that you'll come back and make the, the sure. full purchase. Okay. That spirit in verse 13 is the, earnest or the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So there is an, a part of me that I'm waiting on and that's called the adoption. So the moment I got, is it called the adoption of the body? It's not called the adoption of the body. You're adding words to scripture there. Well, it, uh, the redemption. Okay. The redemption, you're true. The redemption of the body. The spirit uh, until we receive the redemption of the body. And so the moment I got saved is the moment that I was predestinated to receive. No, it doesn't say that. Well, when I got in Christ and that is the, when I'm, I am predestinated to receive the adoption of children, which is the glorification of my body. Okay, but there's a real sense in which you already have, you already are adopted. Where, Galatians, Galatians 4, Galatians 4, all right? What does it say in Galatians 4? 4, 3, no. even so when we were children, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So I've, I've already received the adoption of sons. That we, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Right. The only cross-reference to adoption is the redemption of the body. And you, but you're confusing the redemption of the body and the redemption of our soul. We were redeemed at the cross. I understand, I understand the difference between the two. What okay. I'm saying, though, is the adoption of the, the moment of salvation is not adoption. And because ye are sons, I was birthed into the family of God at the moment of salvation. Correct? Well, in your, in your practice, yeah. But what part did your, you have in that birth? Your will had as much to do with that second birth as it did with the first one. Well, Nothing. I, I disagree with that. Okay, do you have any scripture where well, it tells us we were born not of the will of the flesh, but of God? Yeah, I can't. There, There's nothing in my flesh that I can do. There's nothing that I can will to make God save me. He had to right. initiate salvation, and we'll get to that. But I want to stay here okay. for just a second in, Gal in Galatians chapter 4. Okay, and because ye are sons, I am a son of God through birth, and I will become an adopted son of God through the redemption of my body. There's, no. three way, there's three ways you get into a family. You get in by marriage, you get in by birth, and you get in by adoption. And okay. the purchase is complete because I'm a body, soul, and spirit, right? All right. Okay? Body, soul, and spirit. My soul is married to Christ. My spirit is born again into the family of God. And one day my body will be adopted in. There's three ways in the family, body, soul, and spirit. And all three ways we get in, but we have not received the adoption yet. We are waiting for that. I'm predestinated to it because it doesn't say we're, wait, we're waiting for the adoption of the body. It doesn't say the adoption of the body. We are waiting for the adoption to the win. redemption of the body, right? Okay. Right. The redemption of the body. My body has not been redeemed yet. I agree with that. Okay, but my my soul, my spirit, I've been redeemed. It so, happened at the cross. And it says we have received the, the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, yeah, where would we cry, Abba, Father? That's something right now. The reality of that is right now. We have received the spirit of adoption. Right. And the spirit is the down payment that... <laughs> 
adoption will take place. Well, because I'm still crying, Abba, Father. Because you've been birthed in the family of God. Okay. But you've not been adopted yet. We're waiting. All right. Well, even if we go back, take your view, there's predestination involved in that. And it's according to his good pleasure. The good pleasure of his will. Your will had nothing to do with it. I believe that he willed all men to be saved. No, it doesn't say that. Well, it says who will have all men to be saved in First Timothy chapter 2. Okay, all men. If, well, then also, okay, boy, when you get into all men, that's when you get into that, is that he's talking about all, uh, not all men without exception, but it's because God hardens some people, the vessels of wrath. He blinds others so that they cannot believe. He certainly isn't seeking their salvation. Does God have does so you would believe he you know has mercy on some whom, and he doesn't have mercy on others. That's what he says, and he hardens whom he will harden. Okay. But when you get to the conclusion of all of that through Romans nine Romans nine and ten and eleven, he at the conclusion of that, he concludes all in unbe- all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Okay, yeah, he's talking about, see, you use all like it means all, all without exception. Mm-hmm. It doesn't, hardly ever means that in the scriptures. I can give you lots of examples of that. Um, do, do you want a couple of examples? I got lots of them. Romans chapter 5, though, is, is where it really gets sticky, though. See, all, okay, we can look at Romans 5 if you'd like. You know, this is going all over the place. But, I mean, it's... Uh, all is, is not just Jew, but Jew and Gentile. It's all men without uh, distinction of nationality. Because before, salvation is of the Jews. Only the Jews were God's elect people in the whole Testament. You only have I chosen of all the people of the earth. But now salvation has gone out to all. And he says, there, there in, in First Timothy, uh, Paul is saying, and a teacher of the Gentiles. I lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles. He was sent to the Gentiles. And so it's all people without distinction of nationality. But it's not all people, you know, like every individual. Because God hardens them and he, he, uh, he uh, blinds them so that they cannot believe. And, uh, he, you know, he told Paul, he said, you should be my witness to all people. Right? And then he clarifies that as to kings, to Gentiles, and, and to, to Jews. And uh, that's, that's what all men means. Very rarely is it used to mean every individual. Well, how about Romans chapter 5? Okay, I thought you were going to go there. All right, let's take a look at Romans 5. Okay, Romans chapter 5. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. What verse are you in? I'm in verse 15. Okay. For if through the offense of one many be dead, what does that word many there mean? That means not all. It means many. So through Adam's... A lot. Okay. So through Adam's disobedience, not everybody was made sinners? If not by the offense of Adam. one, many be dead. Well, many died. I, I don't know. It doesn't mean all. It just says many be dead. Okay. Well, so I don't think that everybody died in Adam. You don't think that everybody died in Adam? Mm-mm, not according to that verse. It says many, not all. Well, I think he's contrasting. He's going to get to all men. And he's talking about what what Adam did affected many. I, I, what Christ... I'm being a bit facetious here, brother. I do think... Yeah, I thought you were. <laughs> I'm being a bit facetious. I'm just trying to drive home a point here. Many okay, keep going. I know where you're going with this because I've heard the argument before, yeah. so keep going. Much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Right. So, therefore, the many in verse 15, in reference to being dead, we, me and you would agree, it's talking about everybody, without exception. Well, I think it's, it's drawing a contrast that what one did affected many people. What affected what all? Christ? Well, yeah, but that's not his argument. His argument is what one did, it affected many. What Christ did affected many. Right. Well, 
I agree with that, but he, okay. he he doesn't leave any wiggle room with it, though, because he goes back down into verse number um, uh, 18. Mm-hmm. There, by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteous of one, the free gift came upon all men under justification of life. Okay, let's stop right there because I know your argument. You're actually arguing for universality, for universalism. No. Because it's what the verse says, if we're looking at the way you are. It says that it came upon all men unto justification of life. That means everybody's saved, everybody's redeemed, every individual. That's not what the verse is, is teaching. Then what is it teaching? Okay. I'll... What does it mean when it says it came upon all men unto justification of life? free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. If you cross-reference that with 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Okay. You get there in 2 Corinthians 5 in verse number 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. What these verses clearly teach is that the sacrifice of Christ, and I know Calvinists hate this, and they... I don't hate it. I think, let's see how you're looking at it. Well, the the I, I, I know a lot of Calvinists I've talked to go to berserk when I say this. They really just don't like this statement. But I think the sacrifice of Christ secured the salvation of all men if they accept him. I think that's exactly what these verses are talking about. It sure doesn't say that, brother. Titus chapter 2, 13. For the no, 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 no. Let's look at this verse. Let's look at this. Let's skip around. Let's look at this verse. I'm not skipping around. I'm, I'm cross-referencing. Titus no. 13. Let's look at this verse and see what it says. Be pretty salvation. cross-reference. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath, the hath appeared to all men. To all men. Jew and Gentile. Okay. Not just the Jews. Well, I think. Let's look at this verse. Okay. All right. Because what you're teaching, <laughs> the way you're looking at it, you end up with universalism. That's what Arminianism always leads to. Okay. Let's look, let's look at it. Uh, it says, to wit, in verse 19, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Now, the world is not every individual. Hardly ever is the word world used in that way. I mean, I got a whole, all the way through John, how God uses the word world. But world is used in uh, contrast with, uh, the world is reconciled unto him. He's contrasting Jews and Gentiles in Romans 11. Anyway, reconciling, whatever it is, the world is reconciled. Reconciling the world, not imputing their trespasses unto them. So whatever the world is here, it was reconciled to God, and their trespasses were not imputed. Mm-hmm. What it says, right? Mm-hmm. So what happened at the cross. Whoever this world is that they're talking about, and their trespasses are not imputed. I agree, you know, and I don't think anybody's trespasses are imputed to them right now. And when they, Jesus Christ took our sins in his own, okay. body, he bore them on the tree and he dumped them in hell. And when a man dies, that he dies, that's exactly where he meets him again. Well, no, it never says he dumped them in hell, it doesn't say that. Uh, again, but if, if if he took all of our sins, and that was before you were born, right? Mm-hmm. Is unbelief a sin? Unbelief is a sin. Okay, so if he took away all of your trespasses, well, then it doesn't matter what you do, because they're all gone. Right, but he's not imputing them into them right now. But, yeah, he's not imputing them, right? So, so did okay. It doesn't say right now. It doesn't go on and add right now. No, well, but hang on then. If that's the <laughs> case, though, then were your sins ever imputed to you? They were taken away at the cross. But they, they were, were they, they were nailed to the cross. That's what they, it says. 
they, but they were never imputed to you. When when did they when did your sins get imputed to you? Uh, well, I I don't know that they were. When is this, I mean maybe in Adam. <laughs> See, I, brother, I think this is the danger, but I think this is the danger of, of, you know, when you get down to it, I was born saved. I was born redeemed. No, I wasn't born saved. I never said that. A lot of Ar Ar Armenians confuse terms. I never said we were born saved. We were not born saved. Were you born I was, when I was born, huh? Were you born on your way to hell? No. No, I wasn't. Because I was one of the elect of God. And I was in Christ when he died and in Christ when he rose. I'm one of his sheep. Were you ever I was never on my way to hell. Were you ever a child of wrath or disobedience? It doesn't well, it doesn't say it. It says, even as others were children of wrath. What does that mean? Do I deserve the wrath of God? Sure. Or does it mean that I was wrathful towards others? Sure. But I was never a child of the devil. So when it says in Ephesians 2, and you have the quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Among and whom you are. Also, we all had our conversation times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the, and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even right. after. Okay, what... What he talked about, he says, you were quickened together with Christ. He's talking to believers, right? And he's telling them what happened to them. And what happened to them was at the cross, they were quickened together with Christ. Were you ever, by nature, the children of wrath or a child of wrath? I don't know. I don't, I don't know that I was. I mean, according to, if, if I was quickened together like the Ephesians were at the cross, I, don't, I didn't never deserve the wrath of God because he bore it for me at the cross. You never deserve the wrath of God? I and myself do, but as I was in Christ who bore my sin, like you said, at the cross, that's when he paid for it. You don't really believe that, though, do you? <laughs> Armenians don't really believe that. Well, we do believe that. We just don't think it gets applied to us till the moment of salvation. Then it, no, until then it wasn't forgiven at the cross. Hang on. I'm still trying to process this in my mind. Okay. I understand that. Ephesians 2, 3, you just said you were never a child of wrath. He's talking to those who were before Christ died. That's what they were. But he's telling them that they, us, that, that we were crucified with him. We were quickened with him. But we that didn't, happened to we huh? didn't exist. We, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not laughing like in some kind of mom. You don't think we existed. We, we didn't exist before. I know that, but we're, who was in Christ? Then who's the us there? You said it applied to us. We were by nature, by nature, natural. There had to be a natural thing. We were born I know. all night. Naturally, we were born. David said in Psalms 51 that he was mm. born, he was shaped in sin, and he was born in iniquity. Right. I'm saying that what happened at the cross changed everything. So you weren't born in sin? Well, in, a, in my practice, I can say that I was, but in my position of who I was in Christ, no. So you were. Am I still a sinner? Yes. So you were. I'm talking about when did these Ephesians, when were they quickened to get, according to this Ephesians right here, and when were they raised? Well, hang on. When, okay. if you were born redeemed, then how are you, how are you by nature the child of wrath? So, so hang on really quick. Were you, were you a child of wrath, by, by nature a child of wrath? Before the cross, that's what people were. He's writing to Gentiles who, before the cross, that's how they lived. And he's talking about just what they were. But he's telling them that you were quickened together with Christ. Quickened together with Christ. Not like Christ, with Christ. Raised together with him. And now you're seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So when do you believe that you were dead spiritually?
Well, I can see that as, as in Adam, I was dead. And I can see a, a, an application in, in my practice. When were you in what? Adam? Huh? When were you in Adam? I was in Adam when he fell. Well, okay. I think the whole human race was. But when were you in Christ? At the cross. And I was chosen in him before the foundation of the world. You, you, when do you believe you got in Christ? I was chosen. I was in Christ before the foundation of the world. Okay. Well, wait, I was in Christ. Okay. But that's the problem. Were you in Adam or were you in Christ? Which one? Again, you're confusing position and practice. Who I am in, in federal head. I was chosen in Christ. Where does but it, then it go through federal head stuff? Because that's not in the Bible. Well, did Adam represent the whole human race? Yes. That's called federal head. All right. Okay. And yes, and we were all in Adam, and then we got at some point we got in Christ. Right. Not before the foundation of the world. Well, it says I was. I mean, I I, I can't get around that. I was chosen in Him. I I can't get around the fact that I was in Christ when He died. If if that's true, the Ephesians is true of Paul, because Paul wasn't a Christian when Christ died, right? No. No, he wasn't. But he says, he quickened us, he concludes himself, together with him. Yeah. Paul, you know, Paul got, I was out killing Christians. Paul got cried. When Paul got in Christ, that's when he got quickened. No, it doesn't say that. It says that we were quickened together with him. We, he includes himself. So you think that, so you think you're laying so much emphasis on the fact of together. You don't yeah, with him, together with him. You, you think that that all happened in the same moment. You don't think it means I'm raised up together. See, if if I got a guy, my tech guy sitting on the couch here, Johnny. Okay. Okay. He sat on the couch first. But if I say we were sitting together on the couch tonight, if some if, if at some point I go and sit on that couch, I can say we were sitting on the couch together. Okay. But got on the couch at the same time. But this, as we were raised, we were quickened together with Christ. We were raised together with Christ. If I and now say, I'm seated. If I say that we got, if, if, if I say that me and my wife got baptized together, okay? Okay. Let's just take basic English. Because I, 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 you know, I, uh -huh. I, I think there's way, I think you're laying so much emphasis. I think you're trying to make the word together take, make so much of a foundation for this doctrine that you have to have the practical verse positional with, with this thing. Uh, if I say me and my wife got baptized together, that doesn't mean that we got dunked at the same time. If she gets no. dunked and then I go in and get dunked, we got baptized together that night. Okay. And it was the same act. I can be as long as but we get together. This says together with Christ. Yeah, I got baptized with my wife. Then you can. Uh, I'm, I'm, okay. <laughs> I'm too much emphasis. You're laying on the wording here to try to make this word together. I was raised up together with him. So here, here's here's where I'm. Are you seated together with Christ in heavenly places now? I am right now. I am together with him. Okay, that was all the doing of God, not yours. It, but here's what I'm trying to here's what I'm trying to get to where, to where I, I really don't understand how how it's not connecting. You said you were in Christ before the foundation of the world. I was chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Were you in Christ though? I'm not real sure. I, I know I was in Christ when He died. Well, you said before that you were in Christ. Well, it seems to be that that I was chosen in Christ. So I'm guessing as my federal head, God chose me in him. Yeah. You said before you were in Christ. So when did you Well, that's what the that's what it seems to say. Were you put, what do you think it means without adding to the scripture? When I got you, if you were chosen in Christ, what does it mean to you? I believe that election, I believe that God's election happens based upon foreknowledge. A foreknowledge of what? Foreknowledge of my faith. 
That never says that. I know Arminians always go there. Well, that is elect, never in the Bible. Well, we're elect according to foreknowledge. What is he foreknowing that makes us elect? Answer he that. He foreknows. Okay, good question. Great question. He foreknows people, his people which he foreknew. To know is like, I never knew you. Right? I never knew you. He's not, not, not talking about, I never knew about you. He did. When he says to Jeremiah, he says, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. To know means I know my sheep, right? It means to have an intimate relationship with some somebody or something. It's the same thing when you say that Adam knew his wife Eve. That's what the word means. It has a special relationship. And so those he foreknew, he predestinated. And it's not that he foreknew your faith because God is the one who gives you faith. Do you, do you understand the logical fallacy of that, though? The logic of fallacy of what? The logical fallacy of what you just said. You're saying that God were elect because he foreknew us. Yeah. He, he foreknew us. We're, but the election, based according to Calvinism, the London Baptist Confession of Faith, the Canons of Dort, whatever, maybe you're the exception of the rule. I don't know. But they all say that election is not based upon foreknowledge or any foreseen faith. Did he he chose us according to Calvinism? He chose us before the foundation of the world, and and had it had nothing. He just it was just of his own good pleasure, right? Okay, exactly. What is he electing us? What what foreknowledge? What does he know? What is he foreknowing that makes us part of the elect? It isn't what he knows. It's whom he knows. He knows people. He, his people whom he foreknew. He said, you only have I known of all the families of the earth, Amos 3.3. 3. You only have I known, all right, to Jeremiah, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and I know my sheep. It, it, and then he says to others, I never knew you. It's not just knowing about them or knowing things about them. But to foreknow is to have that intimate relationship with someone. And that's that his knowing his sheep, his you, for those he foreknew, those is basically those that he chose. So do you think that that Christ had an intimate relationship with you before the foundation of the world? Yeah. I existed in that sense before the foundation of the world. So at people what, exist before they're born. Before I formed thee in the belly. I knew thee. So at what point then do you ever get in Adam? Do you were you ever the children of wrath? Were you ever a child of disobedience? At what point did that ever happen for you? The logic Well, I know I believe that I was in Adam and I believe that I fell in Adam. I think the whole human race did. Okay. Well, but I was chosen in Christ. You know, it, it might uh, if the Bible teaches that, I mean I, I believe that. I think that you're the one that's twisting the scriptures to get something out of it that's not there. Never does the Bible teach that God foreknew or looked down the corridors of time and saw that you were going to believe, and therefore he chose you. That's ridiculous, because God is the one who gives you faith. That, that would be you choosing him. But God's the one who gives faith. You don't do it yourself. I, I, think, that the, I think that's exactly what the Bible teaches, that it us, is us choosing him. Choose you this day. We're, serve okay that's talking when it says choose you this day he's talking to those who are already chosen and who already were redeemed they're already his people he's talking that to about about obedience never says to choose to believe that's just not in the bible or choose to be elect well then why are the that's just not there. then why are the two choices between false gods and the true god that's, he's talking about those who are already his people that he already chose and they are his people he already redeemed them, and then he says, walk with me. So you think the people who Joshua was talking, okay, we, we get down a rabbit hole on that one. All right, well, let me ask you this. Romans chapter 7, okay, number 9. What is Paul talking about here when he says, for I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died? Very good. That's his experience. That's his practicality. Yeah, he, he didn't realize who he was in Christ at that point. He's out killing Christians. And yet in another section he says, he quickened us and includes himself together with Christ. He didn't know what God had done for him. So like I said, the gospel is not something God wants to do, hopes to do. 
It's something that he did. And I don't know that. And so God allows me to walk in my flesh, uh, to, to sin, to do all these things, to be away from him. And then he brings me back, and this is what I did for you at the cross. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, there's a sense in which I'm born again at the cross, and there's another sense in which I'm born again in my experience when I come to, to realize what God has done for me. Yeah, I just, I don't, I think that's extra biblical. I just don't see well, the two. I know, you would have to think that way, I guess. Well, and you would have to think your way, so. Well, I, I see it as being what the Bible teaches, yeah. Right. Well, listen, we're, we're at an hour and 20 minutes here. Um, okay. I, I know we said we were going to get into limited. <laughs> uh, well, we said we did in a sense. I mean, we, we, if, what I would like to do, if you're agreeable with it, um, is I, I think this could easily be broken up into two different segments. Okay. Go ahead and get this one up. I know the people are are wanting to see it and are have already watched it by now as we're saying this because <laughs> it'll already been up. Oh. Um, I think we can get this up and then we can definitely make a, another round back next week and deal with limited atonement. Okay. That'd be fine. Sure. So listen, I appreciate you. I think the conversation has been very good. I have okay. Well, yeah, you're you're not that disagreeable. You're not you're not horrible. So that's that's nice. <laughs> yeah, I'm not nearly as bad as people make me out to be. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, but I've enjoyed the conversation tonight. Oh, me too. Um, and we will we will come back with uh, and if we weren't already uh, uh, an hour and twenty minutes in, we would just yeah, that's plenty. Get, yeah, and if we were on Facebook Live, we would just just take a ride on in there. But we're not. We're recording, and we have to upload. Okay. Blah, blah 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 blah. So we will for sure come back around and get uh get the limited atonement. Okay, uh, bro, that'd be good. Yeah, I always give my guests though the last word. That's uh, something I as as you know, just a principle that I have. I give my guests the last word. So any any concluding remarks about the conversation tonight that you had? No, not really. Just you know that I believe everything took place at the cross. I believe God redeemed His people at the cross. And people with the Armenian point of view or yours, you don't actually believe that God redeemed anybody, that uh, it's just a potential redemption. I don't see that being taught in the Bible at all. And uh, so, yeah, that's where we differ. We just understand it differently. We're reading the same book. We believe the same book. We just don't understand it in quite the same way. Right. All right. Well, Mr. Kenny, thank you. Stay on. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to cut it off here. Uh, but you'll still be on and we'll talk after we end the recording. But brother Kenny, thank you so much for coming. All right. Thank you, brother. Having the conversation.